I am an agent of change. Please repeat that back with me on three. One, two, three. I am an agent of change. That is the declaration I believe we as the child welfare legal system need to embrace in order to revolutionize the system to meet the needs of children and families. To meet the needs of children and families, regardless of the benches or the council's tables that we sit at, in order to meet them with compassion, with humanity, and I'm going to say it, with love. Those words and that revolutionary spirit are actually found in the quote of, of Chief Sitting Bull, famous hunk Papa Lakota chief that stood for principles. He, he's quoted to say is, let's put our minds together to see what life we could create for our children. The context of that quote actually is even stronger when you, know, when you know a little bit about the history. Sitting Bull stood for a way of life that was based upon reciprocity with the earth and with humanity. He, he, uh, when he saw that way of life being attacked by the United States government through forced assimilation, through taking children away, through genocide, he left to Canada with his people and he realized things were similar up there. So eventually he came back with his elders sick and with his families tired, he surrendered. And he comes back to Fort Yates on the shores of the Missouri River up in, uh, on the border of South Dakota and North Dakota. And then he, and he comes there and he's negotiating his surrender. And so in that context, I zoom in on that day and it's, it's December of 1890. And Sitting Bull, Tatanka Ayatanka, his Lakota name, he says, let's put our minds together. And he's speaking not necessarily as a, as a leader, as a chief, which he is. He's a leader of our tribe, the agents of change. But he's also speaking as an artist. As not necessarily the ones that paint pictures or, or sing songs, but he's speaking as an artist, the ones that, that have the empathy and the courage to imagine an alternative to a dire reality. And he, he's speaking as that type of leader. And he says, let's put our minds together and see what future he could make for our children. Maybe you could say he's just simply being existential. Maybe. But what he's also doing is he's actually seeing the future. He's seeing what's possible for, for tribes and what for his community. He's looking to see what my life will look like, what his children's lives look like. And so in child, the child welfare system, I'm going to talk to you about two things. I'm going to talk to you about the Indian Child Welfare Act, which is 41 years old now. And then I'm going to talk to you about this work that's being done in Indian country and tribal communities and tribal courts. Um, but, but first, uh, ICWA just turned 41 years old. I was doing a presentation just recently about ICWA, and it stands for the gold standard in child welfare. I work for a national organization, Casey Family Programs, that's gone on record a few times in amicus briefs. Um, and actually had the signatures of a, of a score of other organizations that are not necessarily native organizations, but organizations that serve children in general. And they've gone on the record to say that ICWA stands as the gold standard. And why does it, why does it stand for the gold standard? You know, and I, I tell the story really quick is that I was given a presentation uh, recently. I present on this all the time and train on this all the time. Um, and recently I, I said, what does ICWA stand for? And as a, a rhetorical response, I said, you know what, the legacy of ICWA is non-compliance. I was feeling really punk rock that day. Um, but no, and I was corrected, and actually I feel I like welcome that correction, is what ICWA does stand for. And it stands for the vanguard. And at the time that it was passed, there was, there was these crazy ideas about, about child welfare that weren't based upon science, that weren't based upon brain development, that weren't based upon families and communities and identity. Um, they, were based, they, they were proceeding to quick termination of parental rights removing children completely out of, out of foster care. At the time ICWA was passed, there was a study that was done that approximately one out of three Indian children were placed out of home. And of, of those one third of children out of home, 90% were in non-Indian homes. And so what ICWA does stand for, why it is the gold standard, is that it's putting a child in the middle of these concentric circles. That we should fight with active efforts, more than reasonable efforts, we should fight with active efforts to keep a child with their family. There's benefits to that. That if they have to be removed because of safety reasons, we should look to relatives and with kin. 48 out of 50 states now have adopted that. They're, that's their mandate actually. They're required to look to kin as a first placement. And beyond that, that they should be in a culturally and a supportive community that affirms their identity. Actually, uh, over half of the state jurisdictions now have fictive kin 
the tri if you will, the tribe of the child, that, that are also placement preferences. And so these are the reasons why. And so most recently I was, um, I, I had this conversation with Bert Hirsch, who was, a, who was one of the attorneys, one of the four attorneys that uh, put pen to paper that wrote the Indian Child Welfare Act about 40 years ago, and I was asking him about, about how this came about. He actually did the study that, that developed the research that they presented to Congress and testimony um, that showed that there was an alarming removal of Indian children in this country um, to pass the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, but he talked about, he barnstormed representing tribes, east to west and north to south in the United States, um, and he's arguing tribal values. He's arguing that this is what it means for a child to be raised in a tribe. And that's, what's, that's what all children need, is to be able to be raised in these concentric circles. I'm gonna to talk to you about a revolutionary program that, or a revolutionary court, specialized court, that's happening in 14 jurisdictions right now, um, either operating an ICWA court, or in the process of, of gonna, going to be an operating in an ICWA court. Um, and these are the five principles. And these are jurisdictions, and so statistically speaking right here, um, actually two out of three Native Americans in the United States actually live off reservation. Approximately two out of three American Indians live off reservation in the United States, so state court jurisdictions where ICWA does apply. Um, and so a lot of these jurisdictions that we're, we're working with are these large cities where there is a big Indian population, Native population that are in those cities. And these are the five principles. And I think these are really important that we, as the legal system, can learn to apply to all children. So we can have ICWA applied to all children. And so first, number one, and, and some of these are more administrative than anything, but, but some of these really capture us as revolutionary thinkers in the child welfare system, as agents of change, if you will. And so number one, judicial leadership. I, I come from a tribe where there's actually many leaders. There's not just one leader. There's, we, we all could be leaders but we all need to have the volition. And in order to have a court, we have to have a, a judge. And so having a judge that has the volition to say, hey, I want to start an ICWA court. I want to change compliance in my jurisdiction. Um, and so that's the first thing we need. We need data collection. I know there's some proposals to collect more data with AFGARS, with ICWA, but what we need data, local data collection within your jurisdiction that tell us what uh, tribes are appearing most and how our compliance is, is happening in our jurisdiction. Informed by that data, who are the tribes that appear most in our jurisdiction? And this is the radical thing I think about ICWA courts um, that, that people aren't necessarily doing at this point is reaching out to those tribes and forming those relationships with those tribes, with those ICWA directors, with those attorneys, with the, the judges that are in tribal courts um, and build those relationships. They're a stakeholder as well in that child um, and having them at the table of talking about what's working well in your state jurisdiction and what could be improved in your state jurisdiction. Um, number four is that training, is that we all have, we, we all are trained upon the spirit of the law and the letter of the law, that we'd be able to be able to get it right uh, the first time, and if there needs to be an appellate uh, activity in our jurisdiction that for that to start to occur. Um, and, and then the last, and, and I think this is really an important part of the ICWA courts, is that us as attorneys, us as social workers, us as judges, have a practice of cultural humility that it's informed by proximity. Some of these ICWA courts, actually, I've, I've gone with them. We've gone out to tribal communities. I've hosted uh, ICWA court judges and attorneys out in tribal communities um, that, to come and see, get on the ground, see what it's like to, to, to walk the streets in Lame Deer, Montana, uh, to be able to meet with people, to hear stories, and what great pride it is to be Lakota, what it is to be Cheyenne, that, that pride that we carry and that identity and how much it means to us and how much it means to all children. Um, this is really critically important, and, and at one point in my life, um, I, I was able to represent, actually the greatest professional accomplishment of my life, I'll say. Um, I, I was represented children in a tribal child welfare system. I got to be their voice, um, and I did that for four and a half years, and I, and I knew through that experience, I, I know the importance of self-care. I know the importance of, the, I, I know that secondary trauma is real, and I'll share with you this one story that actually changed everything for me. That was a paradigm shifting medicine, I will say medicine for me. As one particular day, I, I must have been beaten down that day. I must have had dark spots around my eyes. I must have been limping around that day in court and, and there was an elder in the back, grandfather of the child that I was representing that day and he took pity upon me. And he saw me and he says, hey, what are you doing for lunch? And I said, man, nothing. 
He says, I want to take you to get a sandwich. And, and I remember it so, so vividly, actually, spring. We ate sandwiches outside. And he says, hey, have you ever heard about Siach? And I said, well, and I heard the name. It's a Ute word. Uh, it's in the Ute community that I was working in. It's a Ute word. And I, and I heard the word, and I'm like, yeah, I've heard the word. I don't know what it means. And he says, yeah, it's, it's a monster that steals, the, steals children. It's kind of the, the boogeyman for the Utes. And he said, and it's used all the time. And actually, unfortunately, in 2019, it's used to describe social workers in this community because of the legacy of forced removals, uh, the legacy of boarding school and assimilation. Um, this is what uh, oftentimes is referred to as social workers in this community. Uh, but he says, I have to tell you the, the, the history of that, of that word. I have to tell you the cultural story behind that word, and I'll share that with you right now, is that there was a, there was a little boy sta standing by the river one day. He left his parents. He was out by the river by himself. And Siach, who's a big, tall guy, carries a basket on his back where he steals children. He jumps out of the, the, the reeds, and he takes the boy, and he throws him in his basket. He heads up to the mountains. It's a two-day journey. And so he set up camp the first night, and in that basket, that little boy cried all night long. Horn Toad, who's a cultural hero to the Utes, he wiggled his head into that basket and he said, hey, young man, why are you crying? And the little boy through his tears says, you know, I, I've been taken. I'm never going to dance in our bear dance ever again. I'm never going to hear a beautiful language. I'm never going to hear our songs. I'm never going to have my grandmother's cooking. I'm never going to play with my cousins again. And Horn Toad cried with them. And he says, you know, I have an idea. And they're in the, in the dark. And the little boy re says, what is, what is that? He's like, I want you to use me. And the, horn, and the little boy felt down and felt the horn toad. And those that are, you see a horn toad, it, it looks like a, an arrowhead. And sometimes it, it looks like an arrowhead. And the little boy says, you feel like an arrowhead? He's like, yeah, that's right. I want you to use me in the morning when Siach comes checks on you. And sure enough, just as the horn toad prophesied, Siach comes and lifts up the basket. And, and little boy rises up in, in David-like fashion and throws the arrowhead into the heart of the beast and kills him. He's able to get home to his family. I know that this work is tough. I know that this work has the potential to break your heart. I know that it's our... I know that it's our ability to be agents of change, to meet children with compassion, with humanity, and with love that make a difference, and for us to be a tool in the hand to effectuate positive outcomes for children and connecting them to family and to community and to identity. Thank you very much.